Zoom's added a bunch of bizarre apps to my screen. Okay. <laughs> it was, oh yeah. And my point was, I also, since it's so cold, it, I have to like basically, you know, de thaw my computer every morning. So <laughs> it's just kind of like I'm holding a block of ice here. We, we don't have central air in Japan. So you just have to do space heaters. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a pretty American thing. To yeah, be honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've heard it. Where, where was it? Uh, oh, I was reading a book about a uh, geography of places and um it was it was talking about Saudi Arabia and um if you visit um Riyadh or whatever in like summer bring a coat <laughs> because they iced up every hotel and in inner spot so much Thailand I, I remember I had a Thai friend that said that um they all indoor spaces were ice cubes in the summer because they just go nuts with the the air conditioning <laughs> actually i love that i mean that's like pretty much what i choose to migrate to or are nice places that have great air conditioning so i'm maybe there's like a nice list out there of like places the vacation that are known for having frigid air you know air control vegas is another good one vegas is usually like nice and crispy in some of those casinos in the middle of the night and I, I love the carousel progress, but the only reason it's still there is because it's air conditioned in summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so that that's always a, a, a good one. Um, Top ten uh, human inventions by far, in my opinion. Yeah, is the, uh, the 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 condensing air cooler with the the central AC system. The the wall units in Japan. It's kind of funny, and uh, you know, I'm teaching or whatever, and in, in the classrooms, like. I'll have this little battle turning it on and off because I want the room not to be cold. But then if it's on for a while, it like starts to dry out my sinuses. And <laughs> and I'm like, I can't deal with that. Start hacking. So then I have to turn it off again. Yeah. So there, there is a bit of push pull. I, I honestly, um, it's weird living in Japan. You really do start to just acclimatize to the seasons more. Like it's just like, I'm going to be relatively cold the next two months. And in summer, I'll be sweating half the time. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I've been on the other end of the extreme for a while, because even before I lived in Florida for the last like two decades, I lived in Texas for a little bit. And it, it was like notable if it snowed like one day. Uh, prior to that, I grew up in upstate New York. So I, I have all the fond memories as a kid of snow, but none of the adult memories, which I'm kind of <laughs> happy about. Yeah, I'm coming from Atlanta, I'm mostly the opposite. I mean, you know, the whole city sh shuts down if there's like a centimeter of snow. So... <laughs> I think the city of Atlanta has like five snow plows for five million people. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't uh, see yeah. anything that could go wrong. But yeah, yeah, really. Um, <clears throat> hold on, let me just but, uh, bring. I hope I hope we're ready to get a little bit weird today. Oh sure, why not? Because <laughs> I because because we could have gone in a, in a couple directions, uh, but I found some interesting notes on just the backstories of the original writer some backstories on the written sequel and then i also watched the classic cartoon and then the 96 live action remake okay those are the ones that i i managed to watch that same here i mean actually having watched the remake i'm well i it's not like i loved the remake but i mean I'm, I'm now i'm like okay now you see why maybe they wanted to make that cruella movie like last year right because before mm -hmm. seeing the 90s, I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? I, I guess we, I should, I should just uh, start this up and we can just like roll into all of it then. Yeah, man. So. And, and I've seen Cruella too, but I, I didn't see it recent enough to uh, to review it for this. Well, your screen is flipping it in my screen. That's weird. Zoom yeah, just, I'm seeing that too. <laughs> Zoom you, just Zoom. Zoom just updated like right before I got on. And I feel like this isn't like the best update maybe, but... Anyway, it's mostly a sound thing, so hopefully, you know, we'll cause people seizures if they're watching this on YouTube or something. That's right. <laughs> two, two of me is, is an improvement. <laughs> um, let me leave a three-second gap, and I'll do an intro then. Hello. This is the Occult Disney Podcast, where we look for the hidden mickeys behind the movies i guess I, I i wrote something like that onto our um our new artwork but i don't remember quite what it was and i think i wrote it different somewhere else but yeah you get the general vibe there it's cool hi this is matt kamuj is here as always joining me is thomas Lawrence, the paranoid american hi that's me yep thomas from paranoid america hey how's it going 
pretty good. I, I was telling you before, I'm, I'm, I'm freezing, but, uh, and yeah, if you are watching us on YouTube, sorry for the totally surreal flashing. That's it's like a horror movie or something. So <laughs> weird zoom updates. Okay. You know what? I mean, maybe if I just do a quick flip, uh, Oh, there I am. Today's film, of course, 101 Dalmatians, a film I think was mostly off of my radar. Like, I know I saw it. I think I saw it when I was a kid, like where they just take all the kindergartners to the the, uh, the weekday matinee to keep them out of everyone's hair. I'm pretty sure I saw this movie that way. And I haven't seen it since. And somehow it got in my mind this was very much like a um, second tier Disney film. But doing the research, the year it came out, it was like the sixth top grossing film. Of course, they did all these remakes. Um, and the one that blew my mind is they re-released it in 1991. And it, and it was like the 11th highest grossing movie that year, something crazy like that. Just from the re-release, I'm like, whoa, people like this, I guess, more than I thought. It, it, I mean, it definitely wasn't second tier. If anything, it stood for like the new production method that they had where they were starting to use Xerox instead of, I assume, just everything prior to this was actually hand painting on cells. Um, but this one, I guess, uh, you can see there's a lot more like pencil sketches and a lot more of kind of like rough artwork in some of the shots. And I don't know if that was just the side effect of like the upsampled versions that we get to watch today, or if that was just inherent in the original new process as they were figuring it out. Yeah, I guess it's, you know, like Sleeping Beauty is such a big production, like the, like when you're following the Disney through line or whatever this can't help but feel like a little bit of a step down, I guess, <laughs> but uh, in some ways, in some ways, <laughs> but at the same time, I can't remember any other Disney movie prior to this one that actually has so many different unique animated elements on the screen at the same time. So they, they leverage a lot of the technology in that way. So they've got, a, you know, no one, I don't think I've ever seen more than maybe, you know, I'm just going to throw a random number out there, but definitely not more than like 20, animated elements on the screen at one time and in, in most of the old classic ones whereas this one in a lot of the frames you've got all sorts of different characters animating in different planes and stuff so i don't know for that reason it was really interesting to me and it was again i don't really um mind seeing some of those like sketchier artworks and they didn't stand out as much because there were so many of them if it was a classic one sometimes just like a little bit of the background being out of focus or just one little thing out of line sticks out a lot more. In this case, there was so much of this kind of, you know, penciled sketch background bleeding through in some of the scenes that I just got accustomed to it. And I kind of liked it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, like I said, um, coming back to this movie, I was like, like I could appreciate it more. Um, we did lady in the tramp uh, a little while back. I'm like, I feel like this is a better version of that kind of vibe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I agree. So, <laughs> Uh, because that one, I mean, now I'm like, what was the story? Tramp gets them in trouble, they go to the pound, they get out. Was that it? This this one has a little more meat to the bones, um, and fur to the to the meat to the bones. <laughs> that yeah, of course. <laughs> it, I also appreciated some of the darker sort of aspects of it. Uh, you know, like like they were actually going to kill these puppies. They're talking about hitting them over the head and skinning them, so they didn't kind of like skirt around the issue uh, quite as much in in the cartoon or in the remake. <laughs> Um, would you consider yourself more of a dog person or a cat person? Probably a dog person. Yeah. Okay. We, like, I, we... I, I've had both. I've got both. So. Yeah. I grew when growing up, we had both, and um, I guess I spent more time with with the dog, but I think I'm more of a cat person. To be perfectly honest, I'm probably like a no pet person. I don't want to have to be thinking about those sorts of things, but. <laughs> I got to say though, and this I don't want to sound like an elitist uh, as from the standpoint of dogs, but there's some dogs out there that are just kind of like a like a dog that's just you know I'm a dog I'm dumb I just you know I eat I I run around and I I get sticky, and then there's some dogs that have like a full blown personality, and you know kind of like adapt and turn into like a little friend, uh, and I don't know where that line is, but I've definitely met both both types of those dogs and the same thing with like cats like sometimes you've got a cat that's got like a really strong personality that only you know about and then nobody else ever sees it because it's just like either sleeping or hiding the entire time so like on those ends of the extreme i really love a great dog versus a great cat 
Uh, but I, I think I might like uh, like a dumb cat more than a dumb dog. <laughs> does, that, yeah. does that help? <laughs> kind of. Yeah, my aunt always had, uh, you know, two cats in the house uh, when I was growing up. And when you'd visit, you'd never see the cats. They would successfully hide the entire time it was amazing so, so all you get is the smell and nothing else right and the, the fur the smell and the fur yeah that's right um <laughs> I, I will say for the dogs i i think the bigger the better you know it's the small ones that are super yappy and barking at 3 a.m and the 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 larger the dog is the more chill so so dalmatians are in a pretty good territory i think if you're gonna have a dog that's you know they seem to be a little sharper i, I guess what what did i have of course you know i had a mutt as George Carlin, we don't know what the hell it is, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think it was like miniature collie golden retriever mix or something. So yeah, you know, a medium sized dog. And then that seems to be the best one to have around. Yeah, where, where would you cut the limit off? Like how many, how many Dalmatians do you think you could realistically handle? Oh, two. Yeah. They're not having <laughs> kids. No, you get, you get them, you get them neutered or whatever. Right. <laughs> you old rascal. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, our, our, yeah, we. I guess our dog was mildly dumb because he chased his own tail a lot. So, <laughs> I think or maybe it, it at my fun. height, I think I had six golden retrievers mixed with labs, and at the same time, we had like two or three smaller dogs. Uh, so that I mean, that was a decent amount of dogs for one, you know, one household to contain, and those were huge bags of old Roy, you know, that we would have to go and grab every other day essentially and, and feed these monsters yeah see I, I can barely be bothered to like take out the trash so i mean i do i'm just like you know barely you know i get it done right <laughs> and just um, i mean just to start this off right too i just had the i had the the random idea of if, if you legitimately had a hundred dalmatians um like a like a realistic scenario and let's say you even got the plantation that they were talking about but how much food are we talking about and how much how much, you know, are you cleaning up after these dogs? And I think I did some of the math to to figure out the exact amounts, which was a little bit surprising to me. Well, you become a dog wrangler and you just, you know, invade supermarkets and stuff, you know, once the dogs get a little bit older and have a little bit of a attack power. Because think about that, you know, give it like <laughs> one year, give it one year and you have like an army of dogs to to take the food you want from where you need to take it <laughs> well and, and an adult dog is uh dalmatian is somewhere between 40 and 70 pounds so you start doing the math on that you know by a, an order of magnitude uh, <laughs> it starts adding up quite a bit so you either have to have a lot of acreage just to spread out you know all the dog poop on top of all the food that you would need <laughs> or you prepare to um ransack the uh the target with your army of dogs which sounds fun. If you had but even 100... then, you can only do it so many times until they're out of food, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Then hopefully they restock the stores. You maybe <laughs> you didn't close them. I don't know. I'm. I'm. Yeah. They just put up with you for for ten years plus. <laughs> um. You said you had a lot to say about the book, which is the hundred and one donations by Dottie Smith and the author. So do you want to you want to go there first? Well, I I wanted to note that the original author Dottie Smith. Uh, there's a little bit of an interesting backstory. So her husband was this guy, Alec Macbeth Beasley. And I guess they both got Hollywood struck. So they, they end up moving to Beverly Hills or into Malibu. Um, and, and they both want to be, you know, in films and they both have like a little bit of a kick from acting. And uh, Alec Macbeth Beasley, her husband is kind of an interesting character because his dad was one of the Titanic survivors. And he wrote a book called, the loss of the Titanic SS or something like this. And he actually describes like getting on the boat and like how nice it is and going for a little workout uh, mm -hmm. all the way up to the point where uh, he gets saved and he's, you know, he actually makes it off alive. And, you know, it was just lacking some of the, the pizzazz that I was expecting from like a huge survivor of the Titanic, but it was just, you know, Oh, I didn't even know that the, the boat was sinking. You know, I was dancing and I, I felt a little off balance. So I went and I, um, and I checked and I asked if everyone was okay. And they said everything was fine. So I went back to my room and then I came back out again. And, oh, and the, the boat was sinking. So I just mm -hmm. walked over and there was an open uh, sort of, you know, safety boat that I was able to get on with my kid. And they lowered us down and they almost dropped another boat on top of us. But we shouted and they moved it out of the way. And 
And that was pretty much like, you know, and then he gets saved. So uh, it wasn't the same as the Titanic movie. I definitely think the Titanic movie was a little bit more compelling than this guy's uh, recounting <laughs> of it, but it was interesting nonetheless. And then uh, that guy's mom was also a, a famous actress. She was in the Jabberwocky. She was in a bunch of Pink Panther movies. She was also in some Hammer horror movies from the the 60s and 70s, which is kind of cool. So there's a little bit of a backstory of them already, you know, being familiar with Hollywood. And then the uh, the Cruella de Vil in the uh, Dodie Smith's autobiography mentions that it was based on one of her friends. And one of her friends actually noted that she thought that her dogs would make a nice coat. And I, I don't know if it was, you know, like a set in jest or it was, you know, after a few mimosas at brunch and it just kind of came out. But ultimately, it was a real quote from one of her real friends that inspired this entire story to begin with. I, I'm going to admit my own flight of being really, really stupid. So I, I just I only watched the 1996 one like last night. I'd never seen it before. When it came out, I was, I was you know, 17. You're talking about the live action one right now, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the live action yeah. one, right? You know, when that came out, I was like 17. So that wasn't that I wasn't in the um, demographic for that movie. Um, <laughs> but I never noticed except they they make it so obvious you can't help it's oh yeah deville oh yeah okay devil really like i never picked up on that before for some reason really so because <laughs> in the cartoon it's way more obvious like when she goes and answers her phone it's a literal devil's head with like the pointy red nose and the pointy beard and everything like it's an actual devil that her phone is so yeah I mean, oh yeah i know yeah. it's but you see, I noticed that. Oh, that means she's kind of evil. But I didn't notice the name thing until they just... Her, her name was literally Devil. Yeah. Because <laughs> they spell it on her car and stuff in the live action with like a big D. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, I always thought, yes, I thought of her as a devilish lass. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, last night I was like, oh, my God, I didn't actually like make that connection till just now. Again, I it's didn't. I don't, I haven't, when I don't it's so on the nose, thing. you can't even see it because it's right there in front of your face. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like I said, this is one of the Disney's I'm less familiar with. You know, I haven't actually seen it since I'm a kid, so I haven't put too much thought into it anyway. But uh, yeah, so I would have just so seen the name written in print, basically. <laughs> well, the original story is is pretty similar to how the cartoon goes anyways. There's like a, a few little modifications, which I actually think the cartoon did it a little bit better than the than it would have if they just followed the book directly so there's not a lot you're missing out if you haven't read the original book however what's what's even more interesting is that there was a sequel written to 101 dalmatians called the starlight barking and this was not adopted by disney or anyone else because it goes a little bit off the rails it, it is like the exact opposite of what you might expect from the sequel. So all of the Disney sequels that come out for Dalmatians absolutely don't follow the written sequel. And in the written sequel, all of the dogs wake up one morning and every other animal on the planet, um, you know, assumingly has entered some kind of like a sleeping beauty type deep sleep. Like no one else will wake up. Only the dogs wake up and a handful of cats that are there to help them. So they wake up. They can communicate through ESP with each other, so they no longer have to do the the twilight bark. This is called the starlight bark. Um, so it, it's like a, an actual, you know, like we're talking dog to dog through just mental waves. They can fly. They can operate technology on command. Also, I presumably through ESP. So like if they come across a mechanical gate or, you know, a toll booth or something, they can just think their way through it and they can communicate with it. Um, they also, uh, a large uh, god dog comes down from the stars called, you know, he comes from Sirius. He's the actual star god of Sirius. And he basically tells everyone, hey, like you can all return back to me up into the sky. But when everyone wakes up, the humans will just never know dogs existed. But you can come and live with me in the stars forever. And by the way, you might want to do this because there's an oncoming nuclear war that's going to wipe out all of humanity so like this serious dog star gives all of the dogs this last out and the dogs like kind of think it over and essentially they decide that they'd rather be with their masters because the chance of meeting a special human 
Uh, they just can't miss out on this opportunity. Uh, and then, you know, the nuclear war never actually comes, or maybe it does, but it, it doesn't get into that. And I don't think she ever wrote the third version of this. The post-apocalyptic just, one. <laughs> as I read over this, though, uh, in the, like, I didn't read the, the full book, but I, I skimmed it. I found like a copy online, and then I read a few different summaries of it. And it is as crazy as it sounds, which makes sense on why that particular book didn't get adopted. But oh, how I wish it did. I really think that this one would have been such an interesting story to adopt you know yeah it's kind of like um how we need that second forest gump movie where things really get off the rails <laughs> <laughs> um which i get what happens in that it's I, actually i guess i guess the starlight barking is is a little bit more madness but no you're explaining like well why didn't they make that an animated movie somebody should could be like a return to oz situation where you know you you like you could you use this property but you don't use any of the disney specific stuff the opposite direction of course with return to oz but so someone could rock that out i think you know you, you... but and i mean i was thinking too on the same kind of properties that you can make this like a horror movie quite easily by just taking the exact premise and just have cruella deville actually see it through and win although i think that globally it's more acceptable to skin a person and turn a person into a coat than it ever would be for dogs, at least no, I, in, in uh, you know, in the States. No, I have friends that'll be perfectly happy to watch, eight, uh, you know, 101 slasher films, but they don't want to see like a dog die in a movie, you know? Or even like, you know, you want to see like a dog hurt its leg in a movie, you know, even if you know it's animated. So, <laughs> so are, are you a dog fur coat or a cat fur coat person? Which coat would you prefer? Uh, I, w I would probably go for a hypoallergenic dog coat just for practical reasons. Yeah, that that it's kind of the MacGuffin of this movie, which, like you said, if um, uh, if uh, S Smith, uh, Dotty Dotty, sorry, I forgot I'll say her name already, but you know, if she had gotten this comment from her friend, at least has some connection with reality, because otherwise, it's like. Why would you even want to do that in the first place? I mean, you know, like she's got. It could also be like that cute aggression, though. Like I, I could just eat you up, kind of thing, you know, or mm. like I want to just pinch your baby's cheeks right off. Uh, there, I mean, there, there was not a lot of context given because, of course, once you give context to a quote like that, and then it explains it, it takes away some of the mystique. So it just sounds better that one of her friends actually, you know, inspired this movie by this comment. And then the um the voice actor who I believe was also the live action you know rotoscope reference actor uh, and what's her name get that back Betty Lou Gerson yes who was uh in Cinderella was it she had done some previous voice work but yeah she was apparently a uh, modeling sort of after Betty Davis somewhat and uh another reference but yeah that's why her clothes don't quite fit. Um, she, her gray skin pallor is definitely notable in this movie. Like, again, makes her seem kind of, I, well, demonic. I, I should have gotten this earlier, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, again, they, they kind of beat you over the head with it. Like, she literally has a skull for a head. Like, she doesn't even have any sort of muscles or fat on her face. It's just a skull with skin on top of it. I guess, I guess uh, there's some red in there, but yeah, black, white is sort of the main you know, sort of vibe there with the hair. I, I was, uh, you said you saw the newer movie, but it's talking about, oh, they have to explain like why half her head's white and half her head's black. It, again, you know, origin stories we don't need, like Hans Dice or something, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, I prefer the older one, although I don't think you could have pulled that one off in the live action remake without a lot of CGI or, or some interesting practical effects, which might you have been kind of cool. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you don't want 1996 CGI on it for sure. Um. <laughs> no, and there was a couple scenes that uh, that kind of ruined it for that movie too. But they they uh, they try to minimize it, so it's not too bad. And then I was wondering in in both versions, maybe I just don't pay close enough attention, but it doesn't make a hundred percent sense on where Deville gets all of this money, where she can just afford to hire random goons and then just you know use all of her resources to stock puppies to turn into coats. Well, the live action one at least paints her as sort of an executive who probably has a notable bank account because um, she yeah the, she she runs like a Tim Burton esque clothing studio, <laughs> right? Because in the animated one, she just seems to kind of like stumble in like a like a vagrant almost, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> well, it, she almost seems like she's got that old world money because she's got like a Rolls Royce and she's already used to wearing fur. And in, in the book and in, in the um, original movie, Cruella DeVille's just a friend of the wife, you know, of the main character. And that kind of tracks with the autobiography of the author. But in the movie, it's the boss, which makes a million times more sense because then you've got like the Devil Wears Prada sort of dynamic going on where, you know, you want to impress that's the boss but it didn't make sense in the book in the movie the original animation like why are they even friends they don't seem it doesn't seem right at all that these two different people would even be in the uh the same sphere and i think they explain it away in the original that they were roommates or you know they they had known each other early on but it still doesn't make any sense why they would still be associating with each other yeah you are right it makes more sense in the in the live action but i really i kind of like the the insane relationship that you, we see in the, the book and animated movie. I'm like, th- yet, like you said, it doesn't make sense, but I just liked watching that for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's because, you know, you tend to have like that bizarro friend here or there, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. They, they spice it up a little bit. And and another interesting note on Cruella de Vil is that in the Starlight Barking, the dogs decide they want to get revenge and they determine they're going to go and kill Cruella de Vil. But when they all, you know, go to do the deed they see that she's moved on from fur and now she collects metallic plastic items and they decide because of that that they're going to give her a break and they don't murder her uh, metallic which was a very and yeah, plastic? Me- metallic, metallic plastic items which which you have to just imagine uh in like the 19 what 40s 30s or 40s when i think that it was originally written that maybe that was like a cool new futuristic thing is like metallic looking plastics like this but yeah that, oh, was, you can't... that was a specific thing I'm, I'm holding up my little action figure gun i'm guessing that would be the metallic plastic i don't know <clears throat> anyway yeah the, that's a very specific thing to collect it is very specific and it saved her it saved her life so i'm just wondering if uh doddy smith maybe was having a um i don't know like a opioid addiction by this point prescription drug well, addiction so i mean I, <laughs> funny you should mention that I, I don't think that it was necessarily drugs it might have been jesus because she uh, i guess her mom got cancer and she got really close with her mom and in, in the end of her mom's life they both converted to christian science um and then from that point on i think she was a christian scientist for the rest of her life and and it it kind of coincides with a few like they move to Hollywood. There's one right. Um, the second part is that her husband files for a conscientious objector to get out of the war. So that explains that like anti nuclear plot line in the second mm-hmm. one. Um, so that there's a few, and then the Christian scientist thing. Maybe that makes sense where all of a sudden everyone's got ESP and they can fly and they can just um, operate technology on command because you know that that newfangled technology that's too hard to operate and those stupid punch card and abacus machines, you know, it would be great if you could just think your way right through it. So I don't know. A lot of those elements seem to be explained by some of those moves that she kind of made towards, uh, you know, after she wrote that original book and it blew up and she moves to Hollywood and adapts some new ideas and makes new friends. Ah, religion is the opiate of the masses. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Seems so. Yeah, I, I guess you you change. You have a whiplash of uh, you're gonna get some weird, you know, weird wake in that whiplash. Does that make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> I, I've never converted, so I, I don't get the uh, I don't get the revival spirit. I guess, but and it would be that, weird too if that if your husband's family were Titanic survivors. It's just I don't know. It's it's an interesting time to grow up and an interesting set of people and and her parents were you know into hollywood so it it wasn't like she just was this bumpkin that grew up in the middle of you know some you know like an english sort of shire and just wrote this book and was obscured um like there's probably a good reason why the book we even know about and even got adopted is because you know she kind of grew up in like a very eccentric family and time period right on i i did note that one other difference the the dog relationship is a whole lot more convoluted where um, Pongo has the Dalmatians with like a different dog or something, but, and then Parrot is like the, uh, the, the, the stepmom or something, which seemed needlessly convoluted. <laughs> so in, in the book and 
man, I, I'm, I'm not doing a dissertation, so I might have some of this wrong, but I think in the book, in addition to the original puppies that, that Pongo has, there's like a whole other group of Dalmatians that, that are just already kind of in storage that were going to be turned into coats as well. Um, and that's where the 101 come from. They don't uh, all come from the same dog. And I don't know if they almost imply it in the the animated original movie, but he just says, you know, they're like 101, where'd these come from? And then the dad looks over at Pongo and he's like, Pongo, you old rascal, you know, kind of implying that he's the one that made all of the, the 100 puppies over the course of, <laughs> you know, well, which which I think is just kind of like a maybe a tongue in cheek reference to the original book. Um, but I think in the book they they kind of explicitly say that it's not all from Pongo. Oh, they they do in the in the movie that he just has fifteen, right? The others are at the the mansion, I believe. But you know, he could have been right. A bad but dog all, but also in the animated movie, the owners are absolutely clueless because they still at the end of the movie don't even realize that Krill Deville was involved in kidnapping the dogs and was actually serious about turning them into a coat. They just kind of have like the husband has some suspicions, and that's pretty much where it stops whereas in the the mood like the remake movie you know they no uncertainty about what she's trying to do karmatically though that it, it, it works because he made a bunch of money you know writing a parodying song with her so <laughs> <laughs> i mean that that is one thing they're talking about how oh he's a down and out songwriter and all that sort of stuff which um He's something else in the book. I, I think in the movie he became a down out songwriter simply so they could put a few songs in the movie. Apparently that's uh, what is referred to as an old theater trick. Just make him a songwriter. But I'm like, okay, they're supposed to be down and out and poor and they have a maid? What? Huh? <laughs> I guess a different well, time. I mean, yeah, come on. We're not talking poor poor. We, we just mean like, you know, normal poor. <laughs> yeah, old money poor. Which means you still have like multiple cars and a nice mansion with like three stories and the resources to not only raise a hundred Dalmatians, but then to say, let's buy an entire plantation just dedicated to it. Well, he has made his, his Corolla song money by then. So by the, the end of the movie, the they one are song, well. Yeah, I guess so. But, <laughs> and, mm. and the balls on this guy to write a song about his wife's friend that she already told him to, to lay off. And it turns into his biggest hit. Um, yeah. It keeps making me think of, um, there is the on the the Tim and Eric sketch comedy show a few years back. There is the petite feet song, which the <laughs> guy walks in with you know tiny feet, and then they start doing a song. Each time you watch it, it seems crueler because they're like, oh, this guy just walks into the bar and they just mercil mercilessly start making fun of him in song form, and he's kind of into it or whatever. It's a, it's a great it's a great clip, but yeah, it's like the insult song directed at acquaintance in your presence is kind of weird i guess <laughs> it leaves open some interesting dynamics though because if there was like a a spiritual successor to the animated movie not only have they they taken away this lady's you know main like she was using all of her resources to do this and now they're just taunting her and writing songs about her and they've got every single dog back not a single dog succumbed to the cold or anything you know we've got a hundred of them so, I mean, it's almost like they're just begging her to come in and kidnap them again. And and all it would take is just hire two goons that are just slightly more competent. And, I mean, she could at least take out a few of them. Like, not even a question. She could make a pair of shoes. Yeah, I I didn't realize that uh, that one of the goons was um, Tom Weas uh, excuse me, Weasley's dad. Ron Weasley's dad. I think the actor's name is Tom. But uh, in, the, in the live action one, excuse me. Uh, who is the main goon again? He's someone quite uh, Hugh notable. Laurie from, from yes, House. thank you. Yes, yeah. yes, watching Doctor and, 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 and a bunch of other back. stuff, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for me, Hugh Laurie's always uh, like Black Adder is still my main thought of Hugh Laurie, okay. which is is <laughs> like the last thing people think of now. But when I see him, I always think of Black Adder. So <laughs> there's probably a few other people I do. That was a popular enough show. <laughs> but yeah, I, I did like the casting. Jeff Daniels. Uh, sorry, I'm. Just, skipping ahead to the live action one because I guess I watched it most recently but yeah this was coming I think maybe that was another turn off one I was the wrong age for that when it came out and two I'd just seen Jeff Daniels in like Dumber and Dumber and I didn't want to see him like in a uh, wholesome quirky role so well so I mean believe it or not, like I, I was also because I think we're similar ages so I was also not the demographic of the live action remake at least um, the original animation, same thing. Like it was a babysitter at some point, I'm sure. 
but rewatching the live action was actually a whole lot better than I was expecting it to be or that I remembered it being. And I kind of appreciated that they didn't do the stupid look who's talking now animal voices. You know, they, there was a few places where they might have done some kind of cheesy sound like VO, like, ooh, you know, like they're making like uh, sort of like baby cooing noises. But other than that, I actually really appreciated the original aspect of just having a bunch of trained animals do tricks for a majority of the movie. Yeah. And uh, I had forgotten that it has a um, John Hughes script, which is pretty trippy. And, you know, they paid him way too much money. There was like contractual problems I, in the Disney War book. There's a whole bunch about this. But I, th I think it's one of the things that got um, uh, maybe it might, it might have been one of the last thing Katzenberg did, which, you know, got Michael Eisner to really get pissed at him or something. Paying John Hughes so much money to write this script or something. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 If you read that book, you it know, it didn't seem like they needed it. Like anyone could have written this script. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, yeah. That was aspect. <laughs> exactly. So when I last time I was like, John Hughes wrote the script, what that's so, and then I kind of remembered, but it's yeah. If you've read the Disney war, it's so convoluted. You can't remember what horrible thing who did the what. So <laughs> I guess, I guess that's just a, yeah. Um, corporate sniping you know <laughs> it's a different world than hopefully most of us live in now in the original of course uh we got uh rod taylor who's in the time machine he says some twilight zones this is just before he actually became a name so he is kind of just a rando voice actor here but quickly became a uh yeah the birds okay the time machine had already come out he was an in inglorious bastards that's wild okay are you, are you familiar with him i mean uh rod taylor uh, no, I'd have to see a picture. Okay. Um, have you seen the 1960 Time Machine? Oh, I mean, of course, but I mean, you know, Wait, I mean... he's he's the guy sitting in the time machine. Okay, he's the main actor <laughs> from it. Yeah, he's he's the star, and then um, he's in one of my favorite Twilight Zones. I, I might have mentioned to you, I do a Twilight Zone podcast where mm -hmm. um, there's uh, and when the sky was open, where the the astronauts come back from Earth and just start slowly like disappearing from reality like everyone's forgotten they existed and he's he's quite good in that so um but yeah i was just kind of happy to see that he kind of got his start in this movie i mean it seems that once people started getting into these movies then either they would re be rehired for you know every movie afterwards um or there was a handful that just kind of like went directly into obscurity and it was like the last the only and last thing that they did yeah, because now it's just like, you know, an animated Disney movie usually has to have like some all-star lineup, which is probably a bad idea most of the time. Of course, there's a few actors that can nail it on stage and end screen, but um, on stage, so, sorry, uh, not so a, a voice acting in the, the new live uh, action. <laughs> so we're on a little bit of a tangent, though, but the new Avatar movie just came out uh, recently. And, and there's a, a very similar dynamic to that, too, where they're hiring big budget movie actors, but then just like painting them uh, blue and then putting those stupid little motion tracking balls on their face and then having a moat and then do the VO. But it feels like such a missed opportunity to just have like random people that, you know, just are better at making facial expressions that you might not who know who they are. It's just weird that like we still are expecting movie stars to play roles that we don't even see them in. Yeah. I, I've, um, yeah, I've heard several people after a movie be like, yeah, Kate Winslet was in it. What? Kate Winslet what was in it? What? Where? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? It's a good question. Yeah. Now, now I I found just while we're on that movie, I did see it. And um, I feel like, will people like it? One is, did you like the, what did you think of the first Avatar? That's what you're going to think of the second Avatar. And okay, the other. Fair enough. Fair enough. And the, uh, and the other I've seen that um, is both praise and criticism is, the second hour of the movie's just snorkeling. So <laughs> it's just live action snorks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, uh, in 3D. So if that sounds fantastic, you'll love the movie. If you're like, no, that sounds way too long. It should have been shorter, then eh, maybe it's not for you, right? I love snorkeling. I was down for that. So, you know, I'm like, oh, the plot's not really going anywhere. We're just looking at like the space fish. That's cool. <laughs> To be honest, if a movie's longer than 90 minutes, I'm guaranteed to fall asleep. And the at the first Avatar, the, the first Lord of the Rings, like I've, I saw all these on opening day uh, in like a packed theater and I fell asleep in every single one of them around the, the 50 minute mark or so. So yeah. uh, 
unfortunately, I feel like that would be my the same destiny for me watching the the new Avatar. Yeah, I, I usually stick by that rule. Eh, some 3D keeps me awake. I did fall asleep in The Hobbit, the animated Tintin, both both after work, too. So maybe I shouldn't have gone after work. <laughs> so the, the, the 3D maybe is worse for me because now the the so like ho having to keep up the social appearance of your eyes being open is gone <laughs> once that you have the, the, you know, not only do you have the glasses on to hide that your eyes are closed, but everyone else is so engrossed in like the 3D aspect that... Uh, it's only the snores that really give me away at that point. Yeah. But the one, so I wasn't, I, I didn't shed too, too many tears over those two movies, but yeah, I went to see the, the new Bond film also after, well, it's not that new now, but you know, a year and a half ago. And I did take a notable nap in the middle of it and then had a podcast about it the next day. So oops, <laughs> I was like, I had to go back, read the week and go, oh, what the fuck happened to that movie? <laughs> Not a bad the movie. Not not my favorite Bond by any means, by either. But, but, but on that same note, on that same note, now whenever I watch a movie, so when I started the original animated 101 Dalmatians and it pops up, I'm like, okay, yeah, an hour and 19 minutes and give or take 10 minutes for the opening and ending credits. Like that's that sounds very agreeable to me. And then I when I started watching the 96 live action remake, I'm like, oh, an hour and 45 minutes. Like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> Like it, it, they're just a little bit takes the wind out of it for me, and then, and that's definitely a, a change in how I used to feel because I used to love like oh yeah a three hour movie. Why would you ever want to watch a ninety minute movie? It sounds like such a throwaway. But man, like you know, give me a sixty minute movie, <laughs> give me a fifty yeah. minute. No, I I got a I was watching Casino while going to sleep a few nights ago, and I think I got about fifty minutes in awake, and then woke up and it's like two one thirty, and you know something mad is happening on the screen I'm like whoa what the, the most fun is i have the uh, 60s batman on on disc so sometimes i'll put that on late at night kind of fall asleep and then wake up and then the, and the plot's kind of like in the same place but now it's like a different villain <laughs> it's, it's the like same with the, the old superman the black and white superman show is is almost identical you, you kind of fall asleep you're like oh now they're in africa like turning coal into diamonds with his hands and you fall asleep. oh now they're in paris whatever it's oh, see, kind of like the same plot. Well, no, no, a little different because in Batman, they're always in Gotham City and basically the same plot's happening. It's just, it's three episodes down the line <laughs> that I slept through. So it's just a different villain. But the story actually seems to make sense because it's got the same story for every two episodes. <laughs> so that that's kind of fun. I was kind of enjoying that. Um, taking a look, I guess I should go back to the, the animated one. I'm looking through my notes for uh, things. Well, well I... One of the cool things, too, is that instead of making the guy a musician again and writing songs, they make him a, what they say is a video game designer and what Disney says a video game designer is in 1996. Um, but the the things that he's doing are like not very video game designery. And he also lives in an interesting smart home. I guess you could call it a smart home because he's got like a computer that says hello to the dog when the dog wakes up. And then there's like a little button that's rigged to the side of the door that's also connected to the computer. So they kind of make him seem like he's this technical whiz, but uh, there's not there's nothing else to back it up aside from that little opening sequence. And then just saying that he designs video games. Well, I should note that... Um... The technology we're seeing in his game is pretty much what Disney was going to put up to the plate a year later when they opened Disney Quest. And that same technology you could go enjoy until about 2016. <laughs> Maybe. Although, I mean, I've been to Disney Quest many times because it was right, you know, right by where I was working for the longest time. But um, there was the Aladdin ride, which I think was ahead of its time. But the animation that they're showing in the movie as if it were the video game that they're playing, there was not a there was not a single device on the planet that could have played it at the resolution that they were talking about <laughs> in or outside of Disney Quest uh, until maybe very recently, like when Cuphead came out. So I guess the latest versions of uh, maybe like PS4 are slightly earlier where you could actually have that like cell animated look. Um, but yeah, like the, the the animated look, but it was also interesting because the crux of the game was just on how scary the bad guy was. Like there was no gameplay aspect to it. Uh, the only feedback that their one video game expert person gave them was just that, you know, they needed to feel like they wanted to annihilate the bad guy. So he spends the entire movie trying to brainstorm the perfect villain for a video game 
as opposed to the perfect lyrics to some song. So they kind of tie in the same dynamic where the guy's using Cruella DeVille as the influence to like sell their big thing and hit it big. But uh, this one made a little bit more sense, but also he seemed like just the worst video game designer. The game looked horrible. Uh, the graphics would have been interesting, but the game looked like it was so the garbage. backgrounds all look like, yeah, I was about to say probably, this game would have gone like head to head with Superman 64, you know, which, uh, well, and it, it reminded <laughs> me a lot of, I don't remember the show, Nick arcade, where they would put like the kids inside of the video games. Uh, on like a green screen but also right before they did that they had these really cheap um like like shareware style platformer games that they would have and play head to head and just earn points and there was a few that looked really similar to having this kind of like cell animated look to it um so yeah it reminded me of nick arcade like if nick arcade uh actually had some kind of fidelity it would have been this this dalmatian game that jeff uh jeff bridges was working on that looked like it sucked it was kind of the backgrounds that were really making me think because, you know, the front, the, the cell stuff, I was like, oh, there's referencing the anime of movie. That's cool. So I was kind of looking mm -hmm. at the back and thinking, oh, that looks like digital garbage from the mid 90s. But yeah, yeah, the cell part for sure. Um, something interesting about the 1960 movie is, and I, yeah, this is definitely the first Disney movie that acknowledges television. Because the others are a little more fairy taleish. Uh, I don't think Lady and no Lady and Tramp is set in like 1908. So yeah, this is the first time yeah, you're we right. get television mention, and we get the. And it, it's weird... cool too because they add like a like a little sepia tone and like a vintage effect even to the animation, even though it itself now is like a vintage animation. So it it was had a meta aspect to it for sure. And that was my whole point. This is the first time with Disney really getting meta because they have these um fake commercials which were quite enjoyable and that's where they got one of the songs in the movie and it's kind of just funny how they like um some some of the original reviews and, and the reviews again i this it was more positive reviewed than i thought it was when it first came out but some of the reviews were like oh it doesn't quite have enough music because they were used to the older disney movies which would usually have one or two more songs where this basically just has that jingle the cruel deville song and um and they try to sneak one in at the very end right the that's Dalmatian when, plantation right. yeah. which was a fully composed song that simply didn't make it to the movie in its full form i mean i guess now it you wasn't play it as much of an earwig credits. the first the first one was more of an earwig and just the the melody was a great one for the cruel de vil song yeah it might have been a one-hit wonder so uh, as yeah. long as the, as long as the royalties <laughs> was, keep yeah. coming in <laughs> so but yeah you know because i mean movies have gotten so like you know, meta now, oh, that just happened. So I just thought it was interesting to, that this kind of seems to be the first time we get a little bit of meta creeping in. And um, not not as in the, the the Facebook thing, of course, as in the use of the word. It's hard to, it's hard to use that word now, that and quantum, right? <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, yeah, they're just going to own every every single word and, and like Latin sort of derivative. You won't even be able to put your own words together because they're going to own all the roots. We were, we were watching... Um, the Bates Motel TV show, and I was like, sitting there, when, when was Psycho the first the movie the first time that that term was used? And I went looking, and it was, and before I went looking, I was like, wait a minute, it's a Greek word. Went well, a little different, actually. I did learn, you know, uh, it's like Psycho with a K, I think. So maybe the Hitchcock movie is the first time we just started using it with the C H O spelling and uh, calling that guy a psycho. So. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, it how, depends on how deep you want to get on that one. But that one was just because uh, psychology and like the introspection kind of came from Jung and some of like the German and Austrian philosophers and psychiatrists. And then from them, the concept of psychology kind of came out with like Freud. Right. So a lot of it was kind of this Eastern European mentality. So a lot of it was spelt with the K in, in like the, almost like an Austrian, German, Swiss source. But as soon as it hopped over and came into America, then it kind of like dropped that and got the C. Yeah, um, it it uh, became anglic anglicized. Right. Because one of my um, one of the recent Twilight Zones I looked at, which I guess had an early 1961 air date. So they wouldn't have necessarily seen Psycho yet. Um, had the, Oh, that guy's psychological. And I was like, oh, it's kind of weird to say it that way. <laughs> like that guy's crazy. That guy's psychological. About about the psycho movie that famous shower scene was actually based on a earlier movie from oh, i want to say it was like earlier than 42 might have been 38 or 39 but it was a movie called the seventh victim and that actually had the the og shower scene that 
uh, then got kind of, you know, in, ended up inspiring the shower scene from Psycho that became way more famous. Right, right. Well, they got the editing snap, which I, I haven't seen the original. Maybe it's better. I don't know. But uh, no, I mean, <laughs> there, there might be a little more finessing on, on the newer one. But uh, yeah, I, I, so just to segue it, I guess I guess Cruella is, a, is pretty much a proper psycho. It's It's aimed towards dogs. But like you said, that in a way could be worse. Although I guess she's just making power moves, like you said, you know, old money power moves. Because uh, yeah. I guess, although a lot of it doesn't make sense. So the only thing that explains all the plot gaps in any of the stories, you know, like the the remake and the old one, uh, and we're gonna ignore the like the latest Cruella movie, but in the '96 remake and the original animation, it doesn't make sense that you'd have all these resources, especially if you had your own clothing company that that was doing well enough that you could hire an entire staff and a potentially an assistant that was somewhat competent, but then in your personal life, hire just the biggest bumbling idiots and not just that, but why wouldn't you just buy one Dalmatian or, you know, a, a male and female Dalmatian and just breed them yourselves. And you've got an endless supply of coats. She doesn't uh, want to live with the dogs. Uh, right, but she had the abandoned place that the guys <laughs> went and took him to in both instances, right? Uh, so like she clearly had the property to raise them on and had the two idiots to do the whole thing. So I mean, there's that aspect, and then also the fact that she expects either in the live action version where she herself is going to go and somehow take all hundred puppies back and skin them personally, or in the animated movie where she expects her two henchmen to kill and skin all hundred of them overnight. Uh, both of those are very unrealistic expectations of someone you'd probably expect to be a psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, when I was watching it, I did think of the twilight bark being like the, the early version of the orange alert that we have now, you know, when a kid goes missing in the city or something, you have the orange alert. So I was <laughs> yeah, like, Amber. Yeah. We get the Amber alerts. Yeah. They should. Oh, maybe Amber. It's sorry. It's been, and, a then, and it's silver that. alert. If, um, if a uh, grandpa wanders away from hospice, they'll call that a silver alert. Okay. I just, I want to turn that to the twilight bark, like in, you know, real life. <laughs> Honestly, dude, like just skip forward to the ESP and, and flying like that and just controlling technology with your mind. Yeah, keep track of your kids using mind powers. Well, I guess some people have kind of done that. So, <laughs> But also, I mean, there, there's no other animal that's awake, right? So humans aren't around to hit you with cars. There's no other predators whatsoever. And again, you can, you can fly at, at super fast speeds. You can communicate through ESP. So it almost seems like it would be the ultimate utopian paradise. There's, there's no danger whatsoever I, I guess right unless you just like over ate yourself or you found like the chocolate factory and the dogs got into the chocolate <laughs> but otherwise there's no natural predators around and you've just got your free reign of the entire planet so i i still want that movie to be made <laughs> oh for sure i don't know why they made 102 dalmatians when they had that source material so <laughs> in either version i think there's a there's a live action one and an animated one. If I, I mean, both made in around 2000. Yeah, you know, uh, I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't find copies in time. I wanted to, and there, there was also a documentary made on the making of the animated film uh, that I wasn't able to find a copy of. But, but after watching the '96 live action remake, and I feel horrible saying this because I'm, I'm an animation lover at heart. But I feel like out of the two, I'm more interested in the making of the real one than of the animated one just because of how many different trained animals they needed uh it just seems like that would have been such a cooler experience than just watching like 20 people scan things in xerox xerox machines for you know three years mm -hmm. on end yeah and all the um you know you get all the design elements with the live action so here you you get a cool devil phone but you know someone someone drew that right you don't really need to yeah, see the, the devil phone it. was a huge highlight the krillo deville design was a huge highlight um and i and i liked seeing someone draw i don't know if you saw all hundred on screen at one point but um you know there was a lot of drawing going on and i'm sure it was not fun and i'm glad i wasn't part of any of the production <laughs> but uh it's it's interesting to see maybe in the death march you get all, all 100 at some point or no i'm thinking no, fantasia I, might be a, a good uh exception to the rule here yeah yeah 
No, I, w- I was just thinking, didn't, didn't we see a shot of all the dogs coming into town? But I was like, no, that was Gremlins, <laughs> which I watched for Christmas. <laughs> this is the first film that I think, um, not the first, but yeah, Watt was really out by this point. He apparently was in on story meetings, but um, I assume he was probably starting to think about Epcot by this point and not thinking about the movie so much. Making that big when, map for Epcot, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if this was just part of his business acumen and it was just something that he always did, but he also bought the rights to at least one of this lady's, uh, Dodie Smith's, one of her other books. Um, but they never actually produced it and it took the longest time. And I think finally in like 2016 or something like UPN or no, sorry, it was like BBC ended up making a direct to video or like a, like a TV based movie on one of her other books. But man, Disney just sat on that script for decades. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here looking also. Um, I guess Disney himself wasn't so satisfied with this film when it came out. Uh, Ken Anderson is the art director who really got the Xerox rolling. Um, and yeah, it says, as Watts said, we're never going to have one of those goddamn things again, referring to Dalmatians and its technique, and stated Ken's never going to be an art director again. So. The, the man himself was not really into this, <laughs> though apparently he basically apologized to the guy on his deathbed a few years later. So, <laughs> what was he ever an art director again, or, or did those oh, that, words actually damn him? Oh, I I should check that. He certainly had a few years that I guess he was he was a director and writer at Walt Disney Animation. Okay, he did he did the Jungle Book. They let him back in. Jungle okay. Books after Walt dies, though, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been in progress before that for sure though <laughs> that sounds like such a walt thing though like that that going in and publicly declaring like yeah i hated the art director he's never i'm never gonna hire him again uh that's like just a classic walt disney type of move oh no well, he's straight in on sword in the stone or though maybe he was already doing that because uh, then it's a uh, jungle book's just story it seems yeah, actually, he doesn't. He's not listed as a full art director again until 1977's Pete's Dragon, uh, excepting Sword of the Stone, which was probably already in production. So, yeah, he's just a story guy uh, between. So, I guess there was some truth to those words. I don't know. <laughs> that 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 Disney kiss of death. Yeah, really. Um, because th- this is the one that's notorious for having so many Xeroxed Dalmatians, of course. Um, and when we see the they kept using the technology, but I guess not to this degree. I'm trying to think of another time pre CGI where we would have seen like just extensive Xeroxing. I don't think the rescuers or Robin Hood, I'm sure they have the Xeroxing, but maybe not so obvious. (laughs) Again, I mean, this one with the context of watching it and knowing that this was the first time that they were experimenting with this new technique and having seen all of the previous older ones right before we watched this one, it's it really still feels like amazing, especially for the time. Um, but I, I guess I, I like seeing like the rough edges sometimes. It definitely lacks a little bit of polish in some of the animation sequences. But also, this might be like the, the horrible thing for movie purists, but for the some of these in the scenes, I'll watch it at like one and a half X. Or one, you know, as as much as I can handle still listening and having the intelligible sort of dialogue. But once you start playing at those faster animation speeds, man, the older animation looks great because <laughs> it's running at like 30 frames a second instead of 12 frames a second or 15. Oh, I should have done that because I I actually did watch the um uh, uh, the newer one at slightly faster speed just because of time and I do that sometimes. But I watched I watched it's weird the in live animated action. one. Live I, live action gives it that weird soap opera look. But if you do it for animation, it just makes it look so much sharper. Okay. I completely did it the wrong way then. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I watch animation at normal speed and the live action one slightly faster. But again, I'm used to that. It was like two years ago, um, you know, I'd see my my parent in laws downstairs watching like Korean dramas at double speed. I'm like, why are you doing that? You're not even enjoying the thing properly. But once I started doing a lot of podcasts, sometimes, especially when it's like an educational film or something, it's like double speed. <laughs> so I, I guess I well, get it's, it. It's now. so much easier to speed something up than it would ever be to slow it down. Because if someone's talking really fast, even if you slow it down, it's a little bit harder to understand. But if someone just 
talks really slow. It just makes it so easy to speed it up and you can get used to it within minutes. What I love is um, on my phone, you know, listening to podcasts, sometimes I'll start the podcast and I've accidentally like hit the half speed or something. So suddenly everyone sounds touched. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, it's real, I was it's like, what's wrong with them? Oh, it's my phone that's wrong with them. Okay, that's good. They they didn't just get like a severe trauma blow to the head or something. <laughs> I was thinking one reason maybe this doesn't seem like because it kind of is one of the big Disney movies, but someone like me who has, doesn't watch it regularly might feel that way because it it doesn't. I don't think it's ever had the theme park presence, has it? You know, Peter Pan's got the rise, um, got the characters in the park, you know. Um, yeah, no, that's a, a great question. I, I do know that uh, Disney World in Orlando, they have their own little like fire department there. It's very Dalmatian heavy uh, themed, although I don't know if, if they draw direct examples between 101 Dalmatians. I, I'm so I'm just sitting here trying to think of like, what would I make a 101 Dalmatians theme park attraction? Yeah, like this and Lady and the Tramp would be real difficult to make an attraction for those sorts of things. No, the uh, big one is you just sell a bunch of uh, stuffed Luckies and stuffed Rollies. That's oh, where yeah. the money's at anyways. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I don't know. Could you have like a car chase or a... Um, I, it's not Again, really the, exciting It's weird enough. because the whole premise is that if you don't get away, they're going to kill and skin your dog. So maybe... <laughs> Maybe it's just hard to work like a ride around. Like that lady back there is literally skinning our dog. Maybe you're going through the abandoned house, but there's like, it's like a, a little bit of a haunted house quality where it's like knives coming down. Like you are the dog, right? <laughs> and the knives yeah. are coming through. Like, so you're in danger of getting skinned. Uh, you know, children under eight would be very traumatized. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It could be the <laughs> scariest ride at Disney. Cruella de Vil's just peering down at you. So like the alien. I mean, and again, ride. man, not, I mean, just to, just to keep this nice and light since that's where we're at already, but you just change the species of animal and it's literally just like an actual slaughterhouse where they make shoes and coats you know you just change it from a a, a dog into a cow and then bam like now it's it's real like it's no longer a movie plot it's just someone went to work that day well they almost did that in disney's america where they're going to have a roller coaster go through like a, a steel mill <laughs> Not not so much death and gore there. Or how about this? So we can keep it a little Disney. So in the ride, like you're you're a person. You're not like a Dalmatian. It's not like um what was it where you didn't see the character? Um Snow what the original version of Snow White. You never see Snow White because you're supposed to be Snow White. So like you're supposed to be the perspective of Snow White on the original ride. So they had to put change it because everyone was just confused. They're like, "Where's Snow White? She's not on the ride." No, you are Snow White. So in this, in the Dalmatians ride, you would be the humans, and there are Dalmatians trying to skin you. So you really understand <laughs> their their pain now or their trauma. <laughs> it would come off better than the uh, the Snow White ride for sure, because I, I also was very confused by that as a kid. <laughs> There's a few uh, that seem to be like the kind of the M.O. an original, like around the time 101 Dalmatians came out, it was kind of like, oh, you are the main character in the ride going through these experiences. So um, I don't know. if I think by Pinocchio, they'd figured out not to do that anymore. But yeah, it is kind of weird. Like, yeah, because everyone's just like, where's the character then? I'm confused. <laughs> I mean, but but also your only other option was to like stay at home and listen to the radio. So, yeah, yeah, dark rides more exciting than that, I guess. Um, <laughs> the different number of accents in this one was kind of boggling. I mean, it makes sense from like a, it's a kids movie. Well, I don't know Disney movies. I guess it's a family movie. It's for everybody. But yeah, yeah, we have like the Dalmatians themselves. Some of them sound kind of Britishish, and some of them sound kind of American. And you're like, how did that happen? And He's aside from father. Hugh Laurie being in it, and then aside from like one or two shots where they show Big Ben and and some of like the city skyline, it really feels like it's happening in America. I mean, that's as an American watching it in America, it feels like it's happening there. But it it didn't feel like it. It you um had any kind of like unique location aspect to it for sure. It happened anywhere you feel like it happened. Yeah, yeah, because um. I guess Jeff Daniels is supposed to be an expat or whatever. I'm sitting here thinking of uh, 
what is Jolie Richardson's actual nationality? Because I, I remember from Nip Top where she was definitely doing an an American voice. So, well, and Glenn Close is, is playing an American too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Oh yeah, yeah. Weird stuff there. Okay. Uh, let's see where where Jolie's from. There she is. Okay. She hails from. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, she is uh, born London, England. Okay, so she's doing the proper accent and was faking yeah, it. That's canon. I, faking <laughs> it in other movies I've seen. <laughs> so, so as much as I also wanted to credit, just like the cool, I guess they're not practical effects, but like the the trained animal scenes. I love that because it made it a little bit unique. It, and and I'm kind of glad it didn't have the voices, even though I I kind of liked Milo and Otis, and I liked Homeward Bound with the voices. But I like just seeing animals do the tricks. I guess I'm really simple in that way. And and on that same simple note, there's a point in the live action remake where one of the dogs like pees on a magazine, and then they slip in the pee. And I don't know that that delighted me. I just I liked it, and I felt a little embarrassed for liking it so much because then immediately after one of the goons. I guess is checking to see if something's wrong with the car and they imply that the way he checked to see if the car was okay by sticking his head right up to the tailpipe and it like blew it over and I made I just made a note that you know some of some of the jokes here are just childish and then I looked at my note above that was like I like it when they slip in the pee so oh, I guess yeah. <laughs> I, I I remember I have a few fully stupid notes uh here <laughs> I wrote I want to steal puddles. That's not that, that was fun. Just I guess that was the pronunciation of the movie. Um let's see, I was assuming Master had ganja in his pipe. Because he's a musician. Yeah. <laughs> Where else there's, and there's something to too that I, that I like about seeing classic cartoons where the characters smoke or drink. Uh just because it does it happens so much less now. Uh, you know, that I don't know, it feels like it's it's dating it in like a cool way. Like they make they make smoking cool again because it's in this old animated movie. Of course, now we have like you know they'll have stills where of course you just um, airbrush or CGI out the mm -hmm. cigarettes in people's hands. So I, I think even some of the get back promo materials for the, the Beatles one. I think in the pictures maybe they got rid of it. Of course, in the movie they did because that's just not realistic or whatever. So <laughs> no, the, the movie came with a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was second for sure. Um, <laughs> uh sorry, I had a thought about the uh, oh I lost that thought, but I will go really back to Jolie Richardson. I also noticed when we were on when I was on her page that she is Vanessa Redgrave's daughter, which I did not know. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Dirty dogs, all that stuff. I'm having a look on my notes. I, I I might be through my basic thoughts. This isn't one that has like you know the, I mean it's got movie magic, but I I guess it doesn't have too much magic magic unless you want to like give me something I totally missed. Well, there's a little bit of magic in the. I mean, let's ignore the hundred and one Dalmatian part. Let's just go on the the first fifteen in the first litter, and that these puppies all make this like huge trek through the snow and they're you know living among soot and and being carried after by criminals but even in that first litter delivery it seems very statistically unlikely that every one of the 15 would make it through uh not just birth but then everything else that happens to them i mean it would if it was just a little bit more realistic, it, it just becomes a very sad movie immediately because now you're talking about uh, at least a handful of dead puppies within, you know, a couple months time lapsed. And so what I, was, I consider that movie magic. What what was up with the maid anyway? She's like, here, let me show you your dead puppy first. <laughs> Let's well, and in the, the cartoon, it, it almost feels like she was throwing him like a softball like oh you know Ma masters that hasn't been feeling great there's this puppy that's probably dead but he could probably you know if i just like bump it it'll come back to life but i'll let him do this because she almost gives it to him and like smiles about it and like skirts off and then in the movie um and again maybe it's just because disney doesn't want like that somber like here's a dead puppy i'm handing you but even in the movie she kind of just like hands it off to him very matter of factly and just kind of like walks away so it, it feels very low risk in both scenario. 
but I, I can't imagine any other outcome where like <laughs> what is it like the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes opening and there's already a dog like a puppy that they kill on screen uh there's just no way that that works in a disney movie no i mean they can't really be like well 98 puppies made it in the end because they went through a death march on the snow and that's that's pretty yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good odds but... really didn't make it <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know it's I, I guess it's not that long of a death march but still yeah little puppies eh, they're not all making it sorry you know if you get like 70 percent back that's you're doing pretty good and 84 new puppies is not a good Christmas present, which I, I think we've already alluded to a bit anyway. But <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's uh logistically that sounds like that is now your life. Like you're now the Dalmatian people for the rest of your life. Well, they are getting a plantation, so I guess they're owning it. <laughs> I just <laughs> I just have this this one little note that I uh when Scotland Yard fails, you need the animal farm. So <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting that Scotland Yard would give a shit about the, or, you know, would would care at all about <laughs> these people's um, kind of mutts, right? Like, oh, so great. You're so, you've got this unneutered dog and an unfixed female, and they're just making hundreds of puppies. Yeah, like, we're, we're going to look into that. We're going to look into the people that are, that are stopping you from doing that. We're going to prioritize that. We got five people on it right now, man. <laughs> People go to jail for that all the time here in the States for hoarding animals. I mean, technically it's animal abuse and I don't see how two people could ever take care of a hundred different puppies without one of them getting stuck behind the couch and, you know, stinking the place up after a month. Oh, here's an interesting thing in Japan. I don't know if it's the same in the States, but I think they passed a law two years ago where basically all pets are now chipped. So you'd be able to find the Dalmatians real fast, but it's just kind of creepy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if I don't know if it's actually a law, but uh, if it's definitely looked down on if you don't have it chipped. But yeah, there's definitely a, like you wouldn't be required to have your animal chipped. Okay, yeah, I think they they've gotten to the requirement phase here, <laughs> which uh, has kind of a I think funky we just have too it. many here. <laughs> yeah, because I mean I don't know in Japan it's like hey let's start chipping the people. Yeah, Japan would probably just be like, yeah, sure, whatever, which, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, on that topic, though, I don't think that you need chips. I mean, who doesn't have a phone? Yeah, so, we like, carry them around with us. Yeah, they're, they're, the pets don't don't do that. So because <laughs> every once in a while, oh, I think I'll keep my phone off for a while. And I'm like, oh, I need to send a message. So, yeah, we're, we're all mind talking about opioid addictions, the opioid of the phones. So. <laughs> I mean, they're smart, you know, put put your chip uh, right next to your crack, right? Your little crack pipe that you keep in your pocket all day. <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two for one special. <laughs> Are there any big points, uh, other points you want to throw out on this particular flick? Uh, No, again, it was, they're both interesting watches. I would much prefer to have seen either of these over Lady and the Tramp, any version. Um. And I and I appreciate not having lots of music. And I realize that probably puts me in in a certain niche of Disney movie watchers. But uh, yeah, I, I liked it. I liked the animation. I liked the reuse and the sloppy looks, and even the freaking live action remake. Although the one thing that the live action remake could have absolutely done without was this stupid scene where the dogs are are like riding down a little tunnel, and they've got that classic 1996 cgi that just takes you completely out of it and it just makes absolutely no sense that they spent all that money on you know actual dog trainers and had actual dogs and throughout the entire movie except for a cumulative 20 seconds of mm -hmm. horrible cgi um yeah so it, it just stood out so glaringly and i just wonder if maybe they could just like retouch that up or just cut it out of future versions or um, or if it's just canon now, that's just part of it. It's just it's canon. It's part of the dogs verse now. So <laughs> it's the worst. It's easily the worst part of the whole movie, by far. And um, they were thinking about having the puppies singing a song as they leave Hell Hall, and just and that got clipped. I think it yeah, might that would have been even worse. <laughs> yeah. So so they did they did you a solid there because I, I guess the movies uh, the music's pretty much baked into this movie and like we said there's not that much of it you know it's in the commercial he's actively writing the songs 
Uh, so that's how they enter the movie. That that seems reasonable enough. Um, and also, I wanted I want to think in 1996. I don't know if Disney had put out a single good video game at this point either. So the fact that they have a video game designer in their movie, um, it just it seems like any anything that might have came out of this in terms of video game ancillary products would have been an absolute nightmare for the next decade. That oh two decades. That's why we're out Disney Quest. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And uh, I I went to Disney Quest. I think it was two thousand nine or two thousand ten. And um, but our express purpose of going there was because they had all the uh, retro games. They had like what two floors of like real old school games. So we weren't yeah yep really there for the VR experience. Because if we had gone there for that, we would have been like horribly disappointed. We did some of that stuff because it was there. I, I think Aladdin gave me a headache or made me nauseous or something. But. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah. So we did, we did some of that stuff. We did the bumper cars. That was fun. But uh, yeah, we our main goal for being there was all the retro gaming, which was very cool. And there was some, oh, I'd have to ask my boy. There was some game where it's, it's like that was like the only place that existed at that point in time. So we we were on a very geeky. It, it was a sat. We had a satisfying journey to Disney Quest, which I I haven't heard too many people say. <laughs> uh, well, one of one of the games that they had there too, I think, ended up going to Vegas somewhere. But it was one of the first. They called it virtual reality, but really you just put like a little goggles in front and it had, you know, a screen close to your eyes. But it was a multiplayer arcade game that four different people um, all played a different role. And I think you were trying to like either avoid getting assassinated by this big robot or you had to you know, work together to kill this big robot. And it was straight out of the 90s, you know, like the, it had like lawnmower pan style 3D <laughs> graphics, but it was legitimately like a really interesting thing that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Yeah, so we can we can thank Jeff Daniels for designing all of that. I yeah, thank you, Jeff Daniels. <laughs> um, well, I close it up for today. So this should be, I guess, mid February ish. Anything going on with you about that time? Uh, we've got a whole bunch of new comics in the works, and hopefully, we'll be about halfway done with a new paranoid pamphlet. My original one you can see at mkultracomic.com. And that's a, a little pamphlet in the style of Chick Tracks. And it explains the whole backstory of the CIA's top secret MK Ultra program. And the next pamphlet that we're working on now is the whole backstory and history of homunculi, which is the plural <laughs> form of a homunculus. And it explains where they come from, who originally wrote about them. And it even includes some recipes from ancient grimoires on how to make your own. So and more about I'm, dogs. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's fun. Um so oh yes, yeah, so I was gonna ask you, what is your favorite chick track? Uh I have to go with a classic. There's one called The Beast, and the cover just has like an um, all American family, um, you know, nuclear family, husband, wife, brother, sister, but they all have like upside down crosses on their heads. Um, and it just it just talks about uh, just various Satan. Everything is Satan. And then there's another really good one that's about trick or treating. And I think it's called Trick or Treat. And it just talks about like the pagan origins of Halloween. Um, just a, a hand. I mean, I can we can go off on a long list of some of my absolute. There's a, a fairly newer one called Virtual Reality, which explains Ooh. that the escapism of virtual reality headsets represent sort of like a satanic departure from god in the world so uh, obviously they always they always have that very hardcore uh <laughs> fundamentalist christian vibe to them so like no matter what you're doing if it's not praying then you know satan's got a hold of you and you have to repent so that's yep. kind of the, the ongoing theme my favorite my favorite I, I think it might just be angels or the blue angels or something like that but it's the, the one with the rock band that signs up with lou cipher i picked that one up faster and cruel okay yeah they have and, uh, to really smack you over the head with it don't they and and when they're when they're on stage it shows them singing their song which is like we're gonna rock 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 with the rock is the lyric to their song but the best is um one of them goes into a gay marriage and and um the manager is like i'll give you a wedding present some aids so then the guy like dies of AIDS or whatever. So <laughs> yeah, uh, man, if, if you look into the band chick track, like there's some chick tracks that even the um, Jack T chick died a while ago 
Uh, and now it's in like the the hands of like the third or fourth person that's been running it now. But um, there's some books that even the Chick Publications Company doesn't even acknowledge anymore that exists. It's one, that and my I, favorite's one of those. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to repeat what some of the topics are, but but some <laughs> of them are absolutely beyond dark. And the because if if you think about it, a lot of his audience were, you know, people that were you know fundamentalist Christians, but also prisons. So he appealed a lot to some of like the worst things you could imagine someone may be in prison for. And there was a pamphlet that would pretty much line up with whatever vice you might have found yourself having. And then some a pamphlet telling you that, you know, uh, Jesus forgives you for it. Just, you know, go to church next time and, and buy a bunch of these pamphlets and give them to all your friends. I'm just happy I was um, introduced to them properly uh, being handed one or more at, on the University of Georgia's campus. So... <laughs> Yeah, how old were you at that point like 18 19 i mean it's already okay. hysterical okay. no um that t vintage we just had this would have been like 98 99 and yeah we we had a whole lot of fundamentalists just like doing stump speeches around the university and stuff i, I have a feeling that maybe that still happened it's it is the deep south i don't know well well i found my first one in 2001 on a payphone on a military base um, and I had no idea what I was looking at. I didn't, it didn't seem funny. It seemed interesting. Mine was, I think it was called bad Bob or big bad Bob. And it was about this, this biker that had all these tattoos and he went to jail for like killing somebody, but he finds God in jail. When he comes back out, um, he doesn't want to hang out with his old biker friends anymore. And they like make fun of him and stuff. Uh, but it was, it was basically about this guy, bad Bob. And when I found out, I was like, man, this is kind of like a cool thing that I hadn't seen before. And it took me years until I started seeing other ones. And I realized, oh, there's a very specific theme here. But <laughs> it's, I mean, this is such an interesting little niche topic, but it's a comic book. By all definition, it is absolutely a comic book. But because it's fundamentalist Christian, it doesn't get the same credentials as if it were about you know, like a, like a, like a counterculture or like a snarky thing, people would call it a comic book. But if, if you define it as a comic book, it is the most prolific comic series that humanity has ever seen <laughs> the both in volume of print, but also just the amount of storylines that were self-written and produced and created by one person and the number of languages that any comic book has been put out on the face of the planet. So like, it would just break so many rules within the comic industry that at this point they, they can never acknowledge chick tracks as being actual comic books. Cause he would just start taking all these awards that, that uh, you know, and it, it just doesn't mesh like the fundamentalist Christian crowd and the current sort of hardcore comic nerd crowd does not have a very tight Venn diagram. I hope there, I haven't seen this one. I hope there's a chick track t showing you about the evils of comic books or something. <laughs> oh i think it would i think that would be too self-aware i think that <laughs> one might be a little bit over the line but uh man that's that's an interesting one i mean because because jack chick was loved comics and loved draw i mean you know that was his entire life so i i don't think they would be that much of a self-incriminating thing but you know <laughs> it would be an interesting one to find he can sacrifice what he loves most in the name of Jesus. It's kind. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you know this. He actually had a series of, of legit um, color comic, like the regular sized comics and panels. They just were so much more expensive to produce and ship and um, resell that they never really took off. They were called Crusader Comics. And I was like aware of those and I never okay. read one because that's not what I want from this. <laughs> no, no. And yeah, and. But to me, they were just beyond fascinating. And I found them when I was in my 20s, knowing who Jack Chick was at that point. So I knew what I was going to be in store for. But I actually have a really good friend that grew up with these Chick tracks being given to him at church. And then his parents would go to like the Christian bookstore and buy him Crusader comics at like age eight or nine and give it to him. Be like, read this. This is important. And also it's a really cool comic book. So like the, it, it didn't go in with that kind of like, oh, what a funny, you know, silly thing. I'm a 20 year old and, you know, I'm going to go and drink a beer and laugh about this. But imagine coming across Chick Tracks and Crusader comics at like age eight, nine, 10. And that's the media that you're consuming. It's, it's such a different sort of mentality. Just one more tangent on that tangent. Um, did you ever make it to the Holy Land experience? 
in Orlando. I didn't. I drove by it <laughs> thousands of times, you know, because I because I had to drive by it on my way to Disney at least twice a day. <laughs> um, and then every job that I had until very recently also brought me right by that. And I and I missed that I didn't, but I saw I saw a Bill Maher documentary that wasn't a very good documentary, but he goes to the Holy Land experience, and I feel like. I vicariously saw enough of it through his documentary that I never actually had to pay money to go inside. A, a, a fun fact <laughs> is that in order for the Holy Land experience to get some sort of a tax break and maintain that they were like a religious church oriented thing, um, they had to to make one or two days out of the year, like a free anyone can come. And, you know, entrance is open for the public type of thing. And when they did that, it absolutely decimated that entire area. Like you couldn't park anywhere because all the parking lots and all the businesses around the Holy Land experience were taken up by people that wanted to go in for free that day. And it was just kind of like an unknown thing that, you know, you weren't getting anything done on that side of town if it was one of those free days that they only had for a stupid tax break reason. Yeah, I guess it's the sort of thing where you don't you don't want to go there till you can't, you know. While it's there, it's like, oh God, no. But yeah. uh, once it's gone, you're like, oh, I should I should have had that little kitsch experience. For the for the last, I want to say, um, like right before COVID hit, but for like a year up until then, they were auctioning off all the stuff. Like, so you could have walked away with like some cool Holy Land experience, uh, <laughs> sort of like marquees and and props. I'm sure. Oh yeah, decorate the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, th I think we've gotten way away from Dalmatians, but hey, I like, I mean, the, the theme park's adjacent to all this, right? Well, so. we, we started out with Christian science and ESP and honestly a god coming down from the sky and asking dogs if they wanted to go back up with him. And and honestly, it might be good that we didn't get to go into my Heaven's Gate rant, which <laughs> it, it just reminded me of that nonstop of the Hale Bop Comet and this serious dog star and like, there's an oncoming nuclear war, but you can follow me, but you'll, you'll cease to exist, but you'll live in the stars forever. Uh, I don't know. I, I still want to see that movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The starlight barking, uh, starlight that... barking, highly recommend. Even if you don't want to read the whole book, just read the synopsis in case this sounds like I'm just making it up. All of that a hundred percent true <laughs> ESP flying technology, nuclear war uh serious dog star god all of it i want to see robert zemeckis make that as one of his uncanny valley cgi films that would be fantastic what and, and in a fun <laughs> note to just put a cherry on top of that in the in the starlight barking book um the, the serious the lord dog star actually appears on top of nelson's column and that's that's like kind of like an important monument that I think dates back to very old times, like 20 BC or something like the very original version all the way to where um, in World War II, Germany wanted to take it because it meant all this importance to them. And that's where Sirius, the dog star appears is on top of this column. And that exact same column in 2015, Disney paid, I think like $30,000 to turn it into a huge giant lightsaber uh, to promote Star Wars. Uh, so I feel like Dodie Smith would have uh, appreciated that because she would have been like, oh, there's my Lord Dog Star appearing on the column. Rough, rough. Yeah. <laughs> but also means that nuclear war was soon to follow. So, 